always use the Q&A function. It just helps me to keep track of your questions. Um, you can submit those at any point during the talk and we'll get to as many as possible. So I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for this evening. Dave Gardner is a licensed New York City tour guide and a member of G the Guides Association of New York City. He is a member of the Titanic Historical Society, the Titanic International Society, the British Titanic Society, and the Belfast Titanic Society. He has been to Titanic themed events and or museums in Belfast, Boston, New York, Halifax, Branson, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, New Jersey, and more. He is currently writing a book with expanded threads of information on the subject. And he is here this evening to share um, that information with us. Dave, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ariel, hey. and thank you for having us. Yeah, take it away. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, so uh, here's the plan. I will not be looking at the questions or the answers or the chat or anything like that during the talk, uh, but afterwards I'll be happy to address anything and um, and just uh, in general, just please enjoy. I'll be going through it uh, bit by bit and uh, this will be the show and afterwards I'll be happy to talk to everybody and bear with me, gonna get our screen up and uh, uh, and which is not this, I think. Okay. All right. So uh, now for myself, uh, yes, as Ariel has said, I am, in fact, a uh, tour guide licensed with Canic. And we are an association of tour guides. And what we do is we do tours for each other, uh, neighborhoods or themes, and uh, we think of all sorts of things. And I tried to think of something and uh, you know everybody's been to every neighborhood and I thought of some possible ideas like a chocolate tour but I can't eat that much chocolate or a pizza tour and I can't eat, eat that much pizza and uh, I seriously thought of a Beatles tour but I couldn't really string everything together and one day I just said well how about a Titanic tour and uh, I presented it to the woman I gave her the pitch and she said Dave nobody's ever done a Titanic tour for us and we've been around for about 40 years, so it's on our memory, nothing. But uh, I went ahead and developed it, and uh, I've just been doing research ever since and pursuing it. Now for today, all of the modern photos you're gonna see are mine, and uh, anything vintage will be eminent domain. And uh, I would suggest, of course, you put your screens on extreme magnification. All right, so uh, first we go to uh, we're uh, talking about Greenwich Village here. Now, Greenwich Village was sparsely populated uh, until mm, sometime in the 1700s, 1800s. There was a series of massive yellow fever outbreaks downtown. The last and worst one was in 1822. And we also had cholera, typhoid, and smallpox, but people moved here in force and it really became what it is today. And the word Greenwich is derived from an old Dutch word meaning green village. So the phrase is actually redundant, green village, village, Greenwich village. <laughs> and it's back to 1696. And it's associated with the beat 50s, the hip 60s, with all sorts of beatniks and musicians and artists and so on and so on. Now for New York itself, we have, at the time of the sinking of Titanic, there were many things that were in the collective memory of New York City. For example, the year before we had a terrible fire, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, in which 146 people were all killed, uh, mostly women, and that was uh, in everybody's mind. And uh, in 1904, we had the burning of the General Slocum, which is a, a terrible disaster too as well. And in uh, over a thousand people were uh, died in that uh, horrible tragedy. So those were happening at the time. And now I'm going to go to, uh, if I can do this right, bear with me. Uh, I hope I can do this video clip. Uh, 
And if I do, this should be New York City. Are we seeing this? Do you want to turn your videos down? I can't see anything, Dave. Okay. All right, all right. Get back to that some other time. Okay, so uh, so there were many terrible things happening there. Uh, pardon me, I'm going to have to get my screen figured out here. Bear with me. I have to get the setting where I'm going to advance it. But uh, yes, there, there are many uh, terrible things happening at the time. Uh, pardon me, I'm going to get my setting here. Can I help in any way? Uh, yes, I think so. I have, uh, you're seeing the slocum, right? Uh, no, you have unshared your screen. Okay. Uh, let's. Uh... Yeah, there okay. you go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, thank you, and, uh, and I'm sorry. All right, so uh, there are some, uh, there are some overlaps of the, with the disasters here. The uh, last survivor of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, her name was Rose Friedman. She arrived here from Vienna on the Mauritania in 1909. And after the First World War, she got a job with Q Cunard Shipping Lines. We'll talk, we'll revisit them in a while. And this picture here, this is in the East Village. And this is the memorial to the Slocum disaster. Today, it's a park with people and families and strollers and so on and so on. Now, Dr. Henry Frauenfeld helped to rehabil rehabilitate a victim of the Triangle Fire. Her name was Esther Harris at 18 years old. And the next year, he would survive the sinking of Titanic on lifeboat number five. So uh, the st and today it's a peaceful place here and the silicone even had a band on the stern like Titanic and the crooked inspectors approved her to be seaworthy. Now the crooked owners of the Triangle Faction of the Triangle Fire actually made a modest profit on the insurance of all the people that were killed from that. Now Adela Wotherspoon, the last survivor of the General Slocum disaster, 
Mary James Weatherspoon, who worked in the furniture sales department at Macy's, and of course associated with the Strausses, Isidore and Ida. And they boarded Titanic on Southampton, in Southampton. Now, by contrast, they were the good type of uh, bosses. That was Nathan and his brother, uh, Isidore. They had the first mutual aid society in a business in the US. That means workers would pay dues for medical services and a pension. They even bought a vacation house for the employees with transport paid for. Now, this is intentional. You're not gonna be quizzed or tested or anything like that. And this is purposely, I'm putting all these achievements together, the known achievements of Isidore Strauss here to clobber you just to make the point that he was so philanthropic that it's so many things we can't even uh, put them all together. This is my list as best as I have, but of course I'm sure he was quietly philanthropic with many other things too as, as well. And of course his wife Ida was also active with many things. And of course they lost so, uh, he has, he was an old man, you can see the beard, but uh, you can say that they really died too young. And these pictures, by the way, were a close-up of the Strauss plaque in this current store. But he was in fact founded in Greenwich Village. This is on 14th Street. And here's the vintage picture on the left. Now, Rowan H. Macy, he founded the store here in 1858, which is actually the same day as the birth of future president Theodore Roosevelt, uh, six city blocks away at 20th Street. And also working here at this branch of Macy's was future mayor, Jimmy Walker. Now, Rowan H. Macy is a sailor. One night he was lost at sea. So he's a star to guide him home. He then put a tattoo of a red star on his wrist. When he opened the store, he incorporated that into the logo. So the star you see on the logos that's the star that bought Rowan H. Macy home when he's lost at sea. Now, uh, here's the star here. This was, and no, I'm not smart enough to make a bright blinking blue hour. That's actually two screens I'm toggling back and forth between. But this was visible to many people for a long time. And then unfortunately they painted it now over and it's a pink panel today. It's a pizza shop, but yes, that was there a long time. And they had a crockery store and they had base in, a space in the basement and they rented it to Lazarus Strauss for crockery in 1874. Now this is from courtesy of Anka Schleyer. And this is a piece of crockery here. And this is from, uh, and this would have been used uh, on boats like Titanic. Now this is made by Stoney and Company. They had a department store in Liverpool. They supplied Titanic with 57,000 pieces of crockery and 29,000 pieces of glassware. They did not make the china, but they brokered and distributed. The crown pattern around the saucer is a brown field style named for the designers. And saucers like that, by the way, they were used on Titanic and her sister vessels are highly collectible. So Danke Shen, du Freiland, Anke Schleier for sharing with us the saucer. Now, more uh, crockery involved here. I took this picture in South Street Seaport Museum and the Arabic II was actually the vessel that bought back the body of Wallace Hartley, who was the musician, lead musician on Titanic. And he's one of only two um, victims that are buried back in Europe, him and a Dane. Now today, eBay has 33,000 items for sale under Titanic or White Star Line. I say that because if you look closely, it says White Star Line, but it wouldn't say Arabic 2 or anything else because at the time, these were interchangeable from vessel to vessel. So they marked them White Star Line to reduce theft, but they didn't put the names of the vessels on any of the plates or dishes. Now, Rowan H. Macy, he died in 1877, and he had a successor who took Lazarus Strauss on as a partner in 1888. Lazarus is the first of the Strausses in America. And in 1896, he sold him the entire store. The Lazarus uh, died in 1898, and it went to his sons, Nathan and Isidore, and they moved to Herald Square in 1902. And this is that store now. Now, uh, 
this is Sunglass Hut, and that's a holdout where the original landowner refused to sell. So Macy's um, built on the entire city block, and they didn't own that corner, but they did buy the air rights and put that shopping bag on top. See the crinkled tissue paper? Uh, you can't see the crinkled tissue paper because of the morning sun on my photo, but you may be able to see it on the, the handle of the shopping bag. Now that's at 6th Avenue in Midtown, but uh, not far away in 6th Avenue is the old Henry Siegel Cooper department store still standing. It's now at Bed Bath & Beyond. But Henry Siegel, he was the one who did it, and he actually is a little part of the story because his daughter, Julia Cavendish, survived the sinking of, of Titanic on Lifeboat 6. Now, uh, there, were, uh, there was clamoring for larger piers because we knew that we were going to be needing uh, larger vessels to come in for trade and so on and so on. And my photograph on the, on, on the lower part, that's really mirroring the postcard on the top because you can see the iron archway. That was the superstructure piers that were built at the time. By the way, notice that there's horse carriages at the ground level. And the, um, so that's Pier 61, and we're looking downtown from those. And so they were, now this is Google Maps, and virtually every uh, road map of Manhattan shows that these streets and avenues are exactly at uh, 90 degree angles, always up and down, left and right. But it's little known that Manhattan is actually skewed 30 degrees. Now, this area on your left where the green arrow was, it was a landfill from 1837. And this is where the big docks are going to be built. But the Department of War said that you couldn't build them that long as long as people wanted them. So the compromise was to cut Manhattan back. So this cutback actually makes the highway almost a perfect north and south. But then with the, with the cutback, they were able to build the piers as long as they wanted. And uh, so this is a uh, Greenwich Village here in this area. And here are some of the vessels used in the piers. And uh, there was two major companies. That, there was the Cunard Lines and there was the White Star Lines. And the Cunard Lines at the time had the largest and fastest vessels in the world, Lusitania and Mauritania. Then White Star decided to get in on the act and their idea was to build the three largest vessels in the world, the Olympic class vessels. So that would be Olympic, Titanic, and later on, Britannic. Now the postcard on the upper left, that's uh, New Jersey. And if you look in the very far distance, that is in fact, the Statue of Liberty. Now, uh, so in January of 1911, the New York Times reported an application to lengthen the piers and they quoted the, the uh, person saying that they would uh, not have dock facilities, which in enable suits such new Leviathans as Olympic and Titanic to find a home. And then went on to uh, urge them to make every nece necessary effort to accommodate the, everybody at the door. And that was Isidore Strauss. So how does the story start with the Cunard lines? And now this is the Cunard estate. And this is actually also uh, my alma mater. This is Wagner College on Staten Island. Note from the vintage photo of the fins on the cars in the back in the foreground, by the way. It's a very beautiful campus. It's a, his old shipping campus and there's new, there's beautiful buildings like this and new science buildings mixed in and everywhere there's squirrels and trees. On a personal note, there, I went to many music recitals in this building and my music fraternity was in a was in uh, the basement uh, of this building. Now, uh, this was uh, founded by Samuel Cunard, and here he is now. And the uh, and he's from uh, Canada, which is why I emphasized it with the red maple leaf there. And the photograph in the center, that is Carpathia, which we'll visit later on. And that was uh, that's anchored right now in Halifax. And several days after the tragedy, the, the Mackie Bennett went back to the area and they fished hundreds of bodies out of the sea and at least 150 are buried in Halifax. And to emphasize the point of being anchored, I included the anchor from the campus of Wagner College here. 
So the Cunard lines were built on the west side, and here are some examples here. I can't say that I know who that three stacker is on the lower left, but these are some pictures of the Cunard lines in the far west village here. And they even had a Cunard store, and I wouldn't pretend to know what was in this store here, but um, uh, I reckon things for the journey ahead, like the latest newspaper and shaving cream and maybe cigars, brandy, playing cards, who knows what, but that's the uh, big superstructure that appears you can see in the background. And now here's Lusitania here. Now my picture here is from the Ellis Island Museum, and there's also a very good room there of about ocean liners and a lot of Titanic is there too. Now, this uh, model, this ship's model is uh, labeled as being Lusitania, but it's really a model of Mauritania converted to look like Lusitania. Apparently, the bow castle area is a dead giveaway. And the inlay was from the City Island Library up in the Bronx, but there's very, in the nautical collection, but there's very bad light. So I had lots of glare taking that picture. Now, this should be known to many New Yorkers. This is in the Fulton Street subway station, and this is Mauritania. No, she's not just some fanciful vessel. She is, in fact, Mauritania. And in 1908, the Evening World, a newspaper, reported the returning on Mauritania was Benjamin Guggenheim. Now, here's Mari again. And by the way, I put this picture in a, in a chat room, and in minutes, about 10 people all unanimously said, oh, she's Mauritania. Apparently, it's the cowl vents. I still don't know what a cowl vent is, but yes, that's Mari. Now pictured in this uh, in this picture here is John Warner Benamillion Gates, who died in Paris in August 1911. At that time, Titanic was still at the fitting out wharf and having worked on on her B deck. And my picture on the left is John Warner's mausoleum up in Woodlawn Cemetery. And the woman modeled for is by Audrey Munson. And she's also the model for the Strauss Memorial up at 106th Street in Broadway. Audrey Munson, by the way, is a fantastic side story. You may want to look into her for, uh, in your own time. She's just one of those really interesting New York stories. Now, John Warner Gates organized the American Steel and Wire Company, which is purchased by J.P. Morgan. And here he is now. And he was a primary shareholder in the IMM, the International Mercantile Marine. That was a consortium of shipping interests that owned, among other things, the White Star Line, which owned Titanic. Now, as a foreigner, he couldn't own Titanic, but he could own the company that owned Titanic. And uh, also, with absolutely no um, obligation whatsoever, after the uh, disaster, he donated $10,000 to the survivors and their families. Now, this is an approved photo of J.P. Morgan. He only he hated posing for photos, but the ones that he did specifically, he had them retouched. This one, it looks fairly normal, like a conventional photo, but this is what he really actually looked like. He suffered from rhinophyma, which can result from acne rosacea, makes redness in the face, and ruptured blood vessels in the nose. But there he is now, and he's really actually at the White Star Pier, and this is 1912. Near the sinking of Titanic, but everybody has white hats. So this is a few months later, I suppose, sometime in the summer. And here's the piers now. Again, you can see them being built on the lower left. And in both pictures, you can see there's horses and horse carriages, uh, emphasized by my icon of the horse included there. But uh, here's some, some pictures of the big superstructure there. And here's another nice faraway picture. And uh, we're looking at 62, 61, and so on, looking downtown. And in the background, the mighty Hudson River, and in the far background, the great state of New Jersey. Now, in the center of the picture, there's a two-stacker, and I can't tell who she is, but she is at Pier 59. And now, that's early on with the horses, so probably the first uh, decade after the turn of the century. So she could have been Teutonic, Majestic, or Oceanic or maybe the big four, Celtic, Kedrick, Baltic, Adriatic, uh, maybe a ship geek will know exactly who she is, but there's two stacks you can see from here and many other uh, vessel uh, funnels in the background and steam showing up from, uh, from other vessels. Now here's Piers 58, 59, 60, looking uptown and some 
um, unidentified wreckage in the inlay on the upper right, still with the big superstructure here. And in here now, this one is getting a little bit more modern. We're at Pier 54, and you can see some modern looking trucks and automobiles at the ground level. And they're all involved in construction of what on the right you can see is a super highway, uh, or an elevated highway, I should say, which is in the shadow of the piers, or maybe the piers in the shadow of them. So you can see the, there's still traffic on the ground level, but the highway is over, going overhead. Now, the superstructure you can see here was demolished in 1991, and what we now know is the Chelsea Piers is opened in 1995 in August, and lower down there were lower piers open in 1998 called Hudson River Park. Now, here's Olympic here, and she's at the pier again, and as you can see, there's the four stacks clearly visible. And the picture on the right, I know, is a little bit hard to see from farther away, but I just included that with that wonderful picture down on the lower right. And you can see that it's showing an automobile being airlifted, and I'm sure that'll bring back memories, of course, of James Cameron's big epic movie, where at the beginning they airlift the Renault on board. So Olympic, this is her maiden voyage when she arrived in New York for the very first time ever. And on the lower left, this picture is what uh, people would have been looking, this is the kind of view that people would have been seeing at the time. And uh, it's undated, but that may be even from that day, possibly. And the painting on the right is from Norman Wilkinson. Now he did this ordinary exterior painting and he was very interesting because in the first class smoking room of Titanic over the fireplace, he painted a large mural and that was called Plymouth Harbor. That was for Titanic. And in the same location as Olympic, he did the approach to the new world. Now, Norman Wilkinson did this painting and those murals, and he also developed Dazzle. And this was used by uh, many ships during the First World War to try and foil the enemy U-boats because they were torpedoing and sinking many naval vessels and many merchant vessels, and Olympic was in danger. Uh, but she painted up like this uh, to uh, hopefully throw off the, the enemy at the, the U-boats. And so as for <clears throat> the Olympic class vessels, of course, the most famous one is Titanic. And ship geeks that study these vessels, they can look at pictures like this. And then we have people like Jake Billingham, for example, known as Mr. Britannic. And he can just look at a picture and go, oh, well, that's Olympic, that's Lusitania, and so on and so on. And But they all agree that the Olympic class vessels were beautiful. They had long, graceful lines, and they were just very, very beautiful old type ocean class liners, which you really won't see uh, now. And the picture on the top, by the way, that's a photograph, that's Titanic in Southampton. Now, the Olympic class vessels had two barber shops, two libraries, a gymnasium, two masseuses, the first Turkish bath for any vessel, the first heated swimming pool for any vessel, the first squash court for any vessel, the first elevators for second class. And so here's more pictures of her. That's the photos in the City Island Library. Again, this very bad glare there, but uh, the picture on the left is, is called Farewell to Southampton. That's by Ken Marshall. And on the painting on the right, that's uh, by Gordon Johnson showing her right before her collision at sea. Now this is her at sea itself, and this graphic representation was actually done without stars. And I don't know who to credit for this because I found it on, I don't know, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, something, and there's just some sort of weird alphanumeric name uh, on the Twitter. It could have been a rap name, I don't know who. So I'd love to know who did it. By all means, tell me if anybody knows. But this is really uh, nicely illustrated because it shows how beautiful and calm the water was. This is Stoker, who had been to sea for 26 years. He said he had never seen it as calm and smooth as it was that night, as if they were sailing on a sea of glass. And this is a still from Honor and Glory. That's a very compelling video. Well, it's a, a graphic that looks like a video because it covers the entire sinking, the whole two hours, 40 minutes, because it shows the 
collision at first, and then it has like a drone effect where it goes around the vessel, and then sometimes it even goes over it and in there, and they show important doors and important people and so on. So honor and glory, look for that. And so, of course, the basics, which we're mostly knowing, uh, we were expecting RMS Titanic to land here, 1912 on April 18th, but she struck a bird in the North Atlantic and sunk, and the Carpathia came, uh, and they rescued the 712 survivors and came to New York on April 18th. And so here's the still from the big movie, and there's Carpathia depicted with the uh, uh, icebergs and people uh, rowing towards them. And people said they'd never seen a morning like that. Beautiful streaks of pinks and blues going all the way across the sky. And and after all the, and the sun was glittering off the bergs, and after all the stars had faded out, there's one hanging left in the sky, the morning star, the planet Venus. And uh, then later on that day, most Canadians saw an eclipse. And so this is a real actual ticket from Carpathia, and that's uh, donated uh, again by Anka Schleyer. Uh, real actual, and that was probably from a soldier who was probably on her uh, sometime later. Now here's Carpathia again, and these uh, people on the right, there were people, Titanic survivors who were uh, heading back to New York at the time. And my picture on the lower left, that shows, that's lower Broadway, that shows the, the White Star Line offices in the foreground where you see the banner for the subway shop and the large archway in the background, that's the Cunard Shipping Lines office. Now the, in the foreground, that office is now, um, it was a subway sandwich shop and a radio shack and now it's, then it was frozen yogurt and today it's vacant. And so here's another good look at the area and you can see it says White Star Line and there's people walking up the iconic staircase and that was because there were 11 wireless telegraph operators in the area and one of them was here. So people obviously were very uh, anxious and urgent to get news. So here's some pictures of people trying to get a word on the sinking and anybody who might have survived. And these pictures are from a little bit uh, from back farther away, looking down, and you can see there's absolutely no crowd control, no police presence or anything like that, but lots of crowds, lots of people crowded around trying to get news. And in the background on the right, by the way, that photo, you can just see the structure of the old elevated railroad line. That's no longer there. That was demolished in 1940s and 1950s, but that is Battery Park. And in Battery Park is the Wireless Telegraph Operators Memorial. And that's, um, and that's dedicated to uh, telegraphists who lost their lives at sea while sending out calls for help. The probably mentioned on it, as you can see in the picture, is Jack Phillips. And anybody that really follows uh, shipwrecks and disasters, it also mentions the telegraphist from the Vestris and the Hans Hedtoft. Those are some also very interesting vessels that sunk. The Hans Hedtoft is known as the European Titanic. The, she sunk on her maiden voyage and many other parallels. So that's a very interesting thing to watch if you're here in town. Now, um, Another place that had a wireless telegraph was the old Wanamaker's building. And on the left, this is uh, this is the uh, west entrance on Broadway with Grace Church in the foreground. And on the right, my picture shows the east entrance in Astor Place. And today, it's a Kmart. So since we're in, uh, strictly speaking, some people might say that the village, Greenwich Village, ends at Broadway. You could say that, but the East Village is on the other side, I guess, for today's purposes. We'll just call them part of the village because we delve in the East Village as well. But in the true Greenwich Village proper, back to the west side, is the uh, Nabisco building. On the right in the foreground, it says National Biscuit Company. Of course, we know it now as Nabisco. And if you look in the center, it's you need a biscuit all in this one big building. And again, in the background, here they are. There's the piers there. So this artist's conception, nobody could actually be there at that time. There's no buildings like that. But 
that shows what it would have looked like from the ground level. As you can see, you need a biscuit and Nabisco are in one building, but later on, it seems to have been cloven in the middle to make way for 10th Avenue. So you can see Nabisco on the right, and on the left, there's some letters for you need a biscuit. Now, this uh, building in the foreground is very interesting. Now, this is the uh, what's known as the Strand a Hotel at the time. Today, it's simply known by its street address, and it's still there at this time. Now, the streets you can see here are 10th and 11th Avenues, and they're actually merging here, which makes that uh, triangular building uh, a triangle. And we're looking at the sharp and the vertex angle, but the opposite part, the base angle, is 14th Street. Now, to the right out of sight is uh, 9th Avenue and then 8th Avenue. And New York was holding off a lot of people at 8th Avenue, but this is where Carl Van Anda of the New York Times had a breakthrough because he said, because nobody was actually sure where Carpathia was going to go. She could have gone to Halifax, Charleston, uh, Boston, maybe back to England, back to Plymouth, Liverpool, who knows. But uh, Carl Van Anda figured she's going to come to New York. So while everybody else is speculating, he embedded his reporters here in the Strand Hotel. So when Carpathia did in fact come here, his people were able, his guys were able to accost people when they came right off the vessel. So they didn't need to do any speculating because they knew for sure. Now that triangular building also shows up in this undated picture of the arrival of Lusitania. Now you can still see horse carriages at the ground level, but this is interesting because when Lucy is coming in, Pier 55 is built, you can see the scaffolding, but there's Pier 54 is intact, but there's no shed. And Lucy, by the way, is not steaming in, that's tugboats that are pushing her in. But there's the triangle, there's the um, Strand Hotel in the foreground. And now another look at these piers is Mauritania. And again, she's definitely here because of the cowl vents, whatever those are. <laughs> and you can see when, when Mari is here, then Pier 54 has been built at this point, the uh, shed outside. You can even still see a little uh, bit of the triangular hotel there. So there it is in the lower left. And by the way, I couldn't find an unsolving picture of this without the graphics, so I do apologize for that. Now, what's amazing about this area is that the Unita Biscuit building we saw before, when the Broadway show came out, this is where they actually hung one of the banners, a promotional banner. So, coincidence? I have no idea. But anyway, that was looking down over Pier 54, where many years before, the Titanic survivors arrived on Carpathia. So what did actually happen that night? So it was very stormy, rainy. People said they saw lots of th uh, lightning too as well. And Captain Rostron of the Carpathia was arriving, but uh, he was very stingy with information. He told only people as much as they needed to know. And so when she was steaming up the Hudson River coming up, people actually thought she was Mauritania. But then she didn't come to Pier 54 first. First, she went to Pier 59, and she unloaded the lifeboats. Why? Because they're White Star Line property. And also, she probably couldn't have moored properly with them anyway. Of the 20 Titanic lifeboats, she brought along 13. And I don't know who colorized the picture on the right. I suspect maybe Steve Walker, but I've never actually found out who's done that. But uh, even though the crowds were held back at 8th Avenue, these are people who were able to come through, or maybe it is at 8th Avenue, but the, uh, but the picture is a handwritten label, this crowd's waiting to find out news about Titanic. So, and these are people standing in the rain too, so it could have been even more. But again, they were held back, um, but only certain select people were uh, allowed through at that point. So the crowds are waiting and getting larger, trying to find out about news. And Captain Rostin himself was a very modest person, but very noble, very valorous, uh, lots of heroics before, during, and after. So he was just really, in history, just the right person to, uh, to be the one to make the rescue that night. Now, the crew were given a bonus of a month's wages by Cunard as a reward, and some of Titanic's passengers joined together to give them an additional bonus of nearly 900 pounds. 
And so uh, it was done at the expense of uh, passengers. But uh, what happened was when she was here, and this is her now, Cunard's New York office manager, Charles P. Sumner, insisted that she would continue their cruise to the Mediterranean the same day at four o'clock. So since there was a Titanic inquiry, it was agreed that Captain Rostron would speak at 11 a.m. after Mr. Ismay, and they would sail out at four o'clock the same day. Mr. Ismay was the managing director of the White Star Line. Now this light blue picture uh, being taken on board, that was taken by from the Augusta and Lewis Ogden's photo album, and they became godparents to Captain Rostron's daughter, Margaret Ethel, the youngest of his four children. Now, uh, what happened at the time? Now, this picture on the left, this is not my picture. This is actually uh, um, in the Henry Aldridge auction website, but this is typical of all, all the things that people took out of the boats. They even pried off the burgee and the plaques from the side. So everybody ran into the boats and pulled out what they could from them. And so scavengers took them, but there were many questions afterwards uh, in general, like did an officer shoot himself and what did the musicians play, especially what was the last song and what did Captain Smith do? And a big question was what happened to the lifeboats? Now the White Star Line had them in Pier 59 for a little bit, and then they were in a storage area, uh, possibly overhead, maybe in uh, 60. And uh, in, until about December 1912, when the paper trail ends there, that's the last we have records of them, uh, they were probably not assimilated back into the fleet because sailors are very superstitious lot, and I don't think anybody would want a, a lifeboat from Titanic in their boats. And uh, we know they were not used for Olympic because there were pictures of Olympics lifeboats, and they were not these, and they were here also till December. So most likely they were abandoned or scrapped would. Now, Captain Rostron did come back in May and in June, and he was given gifts like the Loving Cup, and he was taken to benefits and fundraisers, and he's even given a black cat, Captain. Nobody really knows what happened to Captain, I suppose, just became a happy ship's cat running around chasing mice and so on and so on, but this is him with Captain, which brings us to our Greenwich Village uh, uh, angle, because this is Molly the cat, and I was able to take a good close-up picture of her. She was famous because poor Molly got stuck behind the wall for 12 days. So people were feeding her over the wall and she, you could hear her crying. And she actually made some of the papers for that. But uh, I'm sure she's forgotten all about it herself. <laughs> now, also a little bit of modern pop culture here. Another nod to both things is the Friends Bill Bank at Bedford and Grove. By the way, there's also a Friends experience going on right now, but it's not nearby, it's up at East 23rd Street. But there are some parallels here because in the pilot of Friends in 1994, Rachel pictured here shows Monica her wedding ring and the old joke about ice. Monica says, I can almost see where Titanic hit it in the pilot of Friends. And one of the possibilities to play Rose in the big movie was Jennifer Aniston. And also now Bill Paxton, who was in the movie, sadly died in 2017. And that was the day before the Oscars. So um, nobody really had the time or luxury to rewrite the speeches. But during the Oscars, the only person to mention him from the stage was Jennifer Aniston. Now, as for people in the movie, Kate doesn't, Kate Winslow doesn't live in Greenwich Village. She does live in Chelsea, but Leo does live in the Greenwich Village. Also living here is Claire Danes and Uma Thurman were both other possibilities to portray Rose in the big movie. Now, Friends is historically accurate because when Rachel Green did have baby Emma, she had it at what would have been nearby, which is actually nearby, which is St. Vincent's Hospital. And here it is now, founded in 1849. And they were in, they're a big mainstay of Greenwich Village history. They were involved in the AIDS crisis and they were the designated hospital in the morning of the attacks of September 11th, 2001, the Triangle Fire, and of course the survivors of Titanic. And so um, people were greeted by the Travelers Aid Society, the Council of, but there were churches, synagogues, drunk tanks, lunatic insane asylums, uh, homeless shelters, everybody's willing to help out. 
uh, they were greeted by the Travelers Aid Society, the Council of Jewish Women, who took women to the shelter for respectable girls, the Clara de Hirsch Home, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, the Municipal, municipal Lodging House, and they actually offered 700 beds for the Titanic survivors. Remember, there's 712 of those. So Mayor Gaynor, who was the mayor at the time, estimated that there were 5,000 accommodations offered that night for the survivors of Titanic. And uh, the hospital, by the way, they uh, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2010 on April 14th, and they delivered their last baby on April 15th. And here I'm just having a little bit of a fun with number play because of the 712 survivors. They treated many of them, and they're in fact between 11th and 12th streets at 7th Avenue. Today, it's a luxury condo. And this picture that I took was where I stood in what was recently become Triangle Park. Oh, there's another picture. And this is actually Harold Bride, one of the other surviving telegraphist, who was feet were in the water so long, he had to be taken off Carpathias after several days by several strong men to be taken there. Rhoda Abbott also was taken there on a stretcher. But this, uh, where I'm taking the picture from, is Triangle Park. And these are in the ground, and these are with many other plaques in the ground, again, for the Toronto fire, the AIDS crisis, and so on and so on, including this uh, Titanic plaque. And since the park was newly dug out on the site of an old annex building, it was in its time the most current Titanic memorial in the world, until another one was uh, dedicated in the Great Lakes area. Today, there's about 400 memorials in over 2,200 countries. And so the survivors are also met by the Women's Relief Committee, which was founded by Sarah Amelia Hewitt, the daughter of Peter Cooper. And this is Cooper Union, founded by Peter Cooper. Today, it's a free school for artists, architects, and engineers. And a big uh, famous speaker here was Abraham Lincoln. And I took this picture of him in Union Square Park, which is nearby Greenwich Village. This is an unusual photograph, a uh, depiction of him, by the way, because here he's wearing a cape. <laughs> I have no idea, don't ask. <laughs> but Lincoln is interesting because his timeline of death is the same as Titanic, because in 1865, he was shot on April 14th, and he died the next day in April 15th. And when the Strausses were married in 1871, that was the day of the Orange Riots in New York, in which 60 people were killed. The parade of Protestants, they were coming downtown, being assaulted by Catholics, and, and actually the parade dispersed here at Cooper Union. Now, Cooper Union is here at Astor Place, named for the Astor family, and John Jacob Astor IV and his wife, soon to be widow, Madeline, and they boarded at Cherbourg. Now, he was interesting because he, now his life was really looking up at the time. He had finally divorced his long, his uh, wife, Ava, who had despised him. Somehow they had two children, we don't know how. But she took what she could get, and then she sailed off to Europe, never to be seen by him again. And his long domineering mother, Caroline Skermerhorn Astor, had finally died. And so he had all his fortune intact, and he had this young wife that he wasn't, you know, bred to be, you know, paired up with. He actually loved her, and so they had a good life uh, that was going to be together. But she was very young. She's about the same age as his adult son, Vincent. And Madeline, she had no ulterior motive. She was already wealthy and she didn't need any publicity or anything like that. So she, you know, really was a love story and she really didn't love him. And, uh, you know, this is a really good uh, marriage uh, by all accounts. Now, I don't know exactly how the story goes. I have the ending of two ways, but the Matthew Bennett uh, also picked up the body of John Jacob Astor. They were able to identify him from the initials in his lapel and he's buried here back in Manhattan. And uh, there was somebody who donated $10,000 to the crew of the Matthew Bennett. And I had thought that it was Madeline, but I heard recently that it may have been his adult son, Vincent, but one of the Astros donated $10,000 to the crew, partially for finding the body of John Jacob Astor IV. So, and there's the family patriarch here who made his fortune from 
furs and uh, beaver pelts and things like that and shipping them uh, off to other countries. And then he got rich again by going into the real estate biz, buying up empty lots in Manhattan while it's still developing. Now, uh, so this is the original John Jacob Astor here. And take a look at the picture of the Astors on the left. This is another picture of them, but lower down, this is Kitty the Airedale. And this is their beloved dog, who unfortunately uh, uh, did not uh, survive the sinking. Now, of the dogs of Titanic, uh, experts believe there were about 10 or 11, and we're pretty sure we know the breeds and the names and the genders and small stories about all of them. And there are actually three dogs that survived the sinking of Titanic, Pekingese and Pomeranian. But this is Kitty the Theodale. And uh, so uh, Madeline, the, uh, unfortunately the family didn't really care for her. So she's buried in the same cemetery as her husband, but not even in the same plot. She's buried, she's buried on the other side of Broadway, uh, uptown at Trinity, uh, uptown at 155th Street and Broadway. Now the Astor presence is still known because the Titanic inquiry was at the Waldeck Astoria Hotel. That was for a few days and then I went back down, to, then I went down to Washington DC and it ended up there. And speaking there was the managing director of the White Star Line, Bruce Ismay. And at the uh, Walder, uh, by the way, JJ wouldn't have st stayed there because he had his own mansion there. But this is another good look at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, which now, by the way, is the site of what is now the Empire State Building. Now this is Gladys Mills. Now, uh, John Warner, uh, oh, and John Warner uh, Gates lived at the Waldorf until 1907. Now this is Gladys Mills. She was born in Newport and her wedding was attended by John Jacob Astor IV and his wife, Ava, his first, first wife, and their little girl of the Astors was one of four girls in the wedding of Gladys's twin sister, Jane. And their father, Ogden Mills, married Ruth Livingston at Grace Church. And here it is now. And by the way, my midday picture is nice, but this is very amazing because at the end of the day, there's a beautiful afternoon sun that glows on this church. So if you're back here at the end of the day, in Greenwich Village, be sure to look at the way the beautiful Grace Church catches that end of the day sun, if you can, if you're here at the right time of year. Now, the plaque on the right is just a coincidence, what with the day here, but here's another uh, interesting coincidence. And uh, now, Alvin Mills, who got married here, uh, oh, and you can see by the coincidence, I'm mentioning that uh, mid-April, so that was uh, another one. But Ogden Mills, she was uh, going to sail on to England on Titanic on April 20th from the U.S. back there, the would have been the return leg of the maiden voyage, but instead he sailed on Mauritania. And his wife, Ruth, was a cousin of Carolyn Astor and tried to compete socially, but was never successful. Now inside, uh, in, now uh, inside Grace Church is, uh, I'm sorry. So after Edgardo Andrew died on Titanic, his brother Alfredo married Harriet Fisher in Grace Church on April 27th. And after that, she went to a manufacturer's convention at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. But the big reason for mentioning Grace Church is Edith Course Evans. Now she was in the sailing and she was at lifeboat four with a friend, Carolyn Brown. And she said, I know we have a family, I'll get the next one. She stepped back, she disappeared and they never even found the body. But here's a plaque for her in Grace Church. And she also has a church out in Sayville, Long Island. And when I was out there, this is uh, it was convenient because it's a nice walking distance from the Maritime Museum, which is nearby. So I was able to go there. And I actually took a picture of a, titan of a plaque for Edith inside the church, but it's probably a little too unethical to show that. <laughs> but uh, that's a nice church that she had there. Now, talking of churches, uh, back to New York, in the East Village, this is St. Mark's in the Bowery, built in 1799. That's the second oldest church building in Manhattan. And Egerton L. Winthrop Jr., like Ogden Mills, was scheduled to sail to England on the return voyage of Titanic. And I don't know how he got back, but his father, like Ogden Mills, sailed back on Mauritania. And his funeral was at Trinity Church and his body was here. And he made several appearances at the Hotel Astor and when he got married in Newport, one of his guests was 
John Jacob Astor IV. And he's actually the guardian representative of his unborn son, John Jacob Astor VI. And in 1909, there's a tribute to the late President Grover Cleveland, and Egerton Winfield Jr. was there, and also with President Taft and Isidore Strauss. And this is at Carnegie Hall. Now, this picture is the subway stop for Carnegie Hall because one of the most famous performers there were, of course, the Beatles. And there's a couple parallels there because the birthplace of the Beatles is, of course, Liverpool, England. And I was there, but I couldn't take this picture. This is from a little bit farther away. This is from the river, I suppose. But uh, they, uh, but there's a few more parallels. Now, this is Rico Fonseca's mural in Greenwich Village. And John Lennon lived in several places, including 105 Bank Street, where he fell in love with Greenwich Village. And his band, pictured here, the Beatles, broke up in 1970 on April 10th, which is the anniversary of Titanic leaving Southampton. And George Harrison's father was actually a crew member for White Star Lines. So there's a big mural in Greenwich Village by Rico Fonseca. And this uh, montage, by the way, I actually lifted this from the hub, from the website of our host today, the GVSHP. Now from Google Maps, John Lennon lived, where my red marker is on the left, at 105 Bank Street, which as the crew flies is a direct east-west line to what is uh, what was then became St. Vincent's Hospital, which would have been at the time. Now nearby where he lived was the Jane Hotel, and this is where the crew was taken. All the fair paying passengers were taken to um, hotels or hospitals, but this is where the Jane was, where the crew was kept. And this picture is actually the real actual crew. And I have keep a laminated picture of this on my tour. So when people are standing there on my Titanic walking tour, they can do a then and now and pull up this photo and take a picture of the, uh, the actual uh, stairway itself. And there's a plaque inside on the floor and it's dedicated to the crew of people who lost their lives. And that's about the same color as this plaque in the Macy's, uh, in Macy's now for the Strausses. And this is, now Nathan was one of the, was the, uh, the brother of Isidore and he's the namesake of Nathan Strauss, which is uh, Nathan Square, which is in the East Village and not far from the Brooklyn Bridge. Now this isn't just a random picture because this is Mayor Gaynor and he's actually heading to work on his first day. He was the mayor at the time of the sinking. And the Brooklyn Bridge comes into the story because Augustus Rogan II died on Titanic and he was born on March 25th, 1881, exactly 30 years before the Triangle Fire. He was not the son of the Washington A. Roebling, but a nephew. His father was Charles. And he helped boats, people into boats and was last seen talking to John Jacob Astor IV. And he died at sea on the Baltic II, and his body was returned on Lusitania. And he's buried in Greenwood Cemetery, who is also buried there is Robert Spedden. And this is uh, uh, the big uh, movie actually derived this real actual photograph. This is Robert Spedden himself. And he's playing the top, and this picture is taken by Father Brown on April 11th on board Titanic and adapted into the big Cameron movie with Leo in the background stealing the coat from A.L. Ryerson. <laughs> now, this is the New York City Marble Cemetery, and buried here is George Corning Fraser, and he's the uncle of young Robert Spedden. His story, by the way, is very dramatic because he survived the sinking at age six, but he died at age nine up in Maine after being killed by an automobile, becoming one of the first people to die in that way in the state of Maine. Now, uh, Lusitania herself, back to her, here she is again, and this is the, uh, she's, this is her maiden voyage. There's the Cunard um, Piers and no sense at all. On the upper right, a picture of some sort, maybe even the same day, you can see all the horse carriages there and the uh, pier later on becoming quite in, uh, decrepit. And so then they merged in 1934, became the Cunard White Star Line. And uh, around uh, then, the and newly elected President FDR arrived at Pier 54 uh, via the USS Indianapolis that very same year, 1934. But they emerged, uh, and then eventually the White Star character was submerged. And after a while, 
uh, Cunard White Star just became uh, the White Star Line. Now, my photograph here is from a special place not typically accessible to the general public. This is showing both Pier 54, the archway in the foreground, and Pier 59 in the background. Now, a big misconception is even perpetuated by many tour guides as well, uh, is about Pier 54, they simplify the story. And they say, oh yeah, well, this is where uh, Titanic was supposed to land, but that's not true because Titanic would have landed at the big golf netting driving range you see in the background where Pier 59 is because Carpathia stopped there first to load off the lifeboat and then she came back here to Pier 54 to, uh, and that's where the survivors disembark. And this is my picture from the pier when it's intact and there's the wall incredibly the Empire State Building because that's where the inquiry was at the time the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. But uh, then it became endangered because uh, the uh, New York, I suppose, declared it to be unsafe for people, which is, of course, nonsense because uh, heavy machinery was taken out there and they were eventually demolishing it. And it's also where Lusitania left for the very last time, which is why I put the candle there because I go out every May 1st and I light a candle for Lucy because after that she was torpedoed up in the open sea near Ireland. And of course, as you can figure on the night of April uh, 18th, I light a candle there too. Not the 14th, the night of the sinking, but the 18th at the time that the survivors would have come here. And out of the 2,208 people there, the passengers, crew, and uh, officers, there were 1,496 victims and 700 total survivors. And so eventually these uh, piers were being demolished. As you can see, they're cutting back most of them now by heavy machinery, which somehow made it on there. And I saw it going in front of me and I said, you know, there's a lot of junk there that won't do anybody any good, but I could use that seeing as it's how it's so historic. So I looked at this hole in the fence, which is just pieces of fences, and I said, well, I think I'm going to make a plan and I'm going to infiltrate this at night and get stuff because I wanted stuff and I wanted it bad. So here I'm at my age and I'm dressed all in black with a camera and a flashlight and a loot bag. And so I went in and I took many pieces of brick and uh, pipe and asphalt and so on and so on. And again, the picture may not look like much, but there's uh, just general stuff that I've taken out of there. And uh, four bricks, by the way, that all say rose on them. So that's very interesting too. So as I mentioned, and here's my chance for a shameless plug, thanks to GBSHP, I do walking tours in Greenwich Village and they start and end in Greenwich Village too. I have some others uh, in other places, but my big one is here at Greenwich Village and you can, um, I'll give the uh, info for myself or any contact about that. Uh, but, uh, but in general, I wanted to thank everybody for attending. And of course, thank you to Ariel for hosting us and to the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. That's us, that's us. Thank you so much, Dave. This was marvelous. And, and thanks to everyone for being here and for um, putting such great feedback and anecdotes in the chat. It's been so wonderful. We do have a few questions. I know it's a, it's a little bit late, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to just um, speed, speed, right, speed right through them. Um, yeah. Are you aware, Richard asks, of any survivors that stayed at the Hotel Walcott? Okay. Um, um, yes, there was actually somebody, uh, I think I corresponded with Richard about this. Uh, yes, I couldn't produce the name, but there was at least one person who stayed there. That's up uh, on Broadway. That's near, that's a few blocks below 34th Street. But yes, the wall cut took some people in and it does have that name, by the way, still to this day, over a century later. And as for what Ariel said, yes, it's been an hour now, so you're free to ditch, but I hope you stick around or if you want to watch Jeopardy or whatever you do, but anybody does stick around, you're free to. And I think Ariel, this will be visible after this anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. Correct, great, okay. Um, we have a question. Um, did the crew members who survived do so because they rode the lifeboat? Rode as in, or uh, operated the lifeboats? Uh, commanded? Well, yes, it is true that the 
uh, now she did launch uh, 16 uh, conventional lifeboats and four collapsibles, and then one or two of those were basically Titanic float in after under them. But the ones that were dispatched were given assigned one or two crew members to command them. So I wouldn't really uh, say that they survived because of that, if you really break it down, yes. But really, after that, it was every person for themselves. There were different philosophies of different people on sides of the ship. Uh, First Officer Murdoch, his mindset was women and children uh, first. Second Officer Lightoller on the other side said women and children only. So it was really a lot of it depended on what side of the ship you were. And uh, some people like Bruce Ismay simply uh, jumped on lifeboat C because there were no other people around at the time and he just got on. And lifeboat C, by the way, was not in the original plan, but that was added later on. They went from 16 up to 20. So he was on one of the boats that were added later on. Such a, such a lottery. Um... Okay, let's see. Mitchell wants to know where in Macy's is the Strauss plaque? Oh, excellent question. Uh, The Strauss plaque is on 34th Street and is fairly identifiable from the ground level because there's a beautiful clock over it and some caryatids. I think that's the architectural name for women holding columns up. And if you go in the lobby there, it's on the left and it's very, it's hard to photograph because it's very high up. So I had to hold my camera up as on my tippy toes and try and get as level as possible. <laughs> and it's very pretty on the flower show, which they have uh, once or twice a year because they drape it in flowers. And of course, Christmas time they have, you know, bells and bubbles around her. But that's on the left hand side. And on the right, there's an identical one dedicated to those who died in the great world war you know mm. the war and all wars <laughs> and so that's if only <laughs> i know right but that's accessible now but in 1986 there was a hostile buyout of the macy of the Strauss family and that uh whole area was closed it was boarded up and when i went there just as a civilian not even a titanic enthusiast i asked where it was and the people in information didn't even know. They had no idea. They were there to just sell Broadway tickets anyway. But uh, finally in 2014, it was reopened and it's now open again to the public. So it's 34th Street entrance, not the big one on Broadway where the the big fancy Christmas windows are. (laughs) Thanks. Um, Marianne wants to know, do you have any information about the plaque placed at St. Vincent Hospital? near the ER in honor of the Titanic's doctor? Great question. Yes, well, actually, yes, there were a, a, there was a plaque there dedicated to the doctors and it was believed that they were uh, lost in the demolition of the hospital. But I found in some correspondence, somebody told me that they actually were able to acquire those plaques in the process. I guess they had an insider. So they're, they're not open to the public, but they're safely in the hands of a private collector. I believe they're in Florida, but I, I'd have to check my messages. So uh, <clears throat> they will or might be accessible somehow, maybe in a book or something at some point. But yes, they have been salvaged from the wreck of the hospital. Thanks. So that's a yes and a no. <laughs> um, let's see. Joanne wants to know, do you think they demolished Pier 54 for some untoward reason, if not because it was unsafe? <laughs> well, very good question as well. Well, that was sort of what I was implying anyway with my photographs of the heavy machinery on it. Uh, the very uh, corners of it were kind of sagging, but you know, at the time they were having full concerts on there, you know, full of people, or even just a DJ with a booth, but still full of people. They had, at the end of the Gay Pride Weekend Parade, they would have fireworks out in the river, and again, it would be some completely filled with people. They had uh, uh, people that would go to see the opera in real time on a screen. They had tennis matches shown, and people just filling the, the whole pier. They had an art exhibit with big uh trailers being piled on top of each other so there were things happening country concerts rock concerts you know when you get uh, you know, a couple thousand people jumping up and down who knows so 
it never, you know, certainly didn't plunge into the river, but it was eventually uh, purchased and demolished by Barry Diller to build what is now Little Island. And that's uh, not exactly in the footprint, but that's exactly, if you look at my picture right now, that's Pier 55, the green structure in the background. And Little Island, these are the uh, cranes actually starting to build it. It's uh, built up now. This picture is from a few years ago, but it's in that site there. But they, but I should say that they have completely preserved and carefully preserved the arch you can see. I took this picture, but I took a picture just the other day and the fence is down and anybody can go through the arch itself. Now I typically have commemorations there and I can go there and light a candle. Now I don't have any bikers whizzing by because I'm a bike lane where everybody's a little bit in danger, but that's, it's now <laughs> uh, open to the public. So the arch is there, but um, I guess the, ultimately the pier must have been purchased by Barry Diller or New York for Barry Diller. Yeah. Yeah, we've and got lo lots of lots of folks weighing, weighing in about this. Oh, okay. Um, and his celebrity wife, Diane von Furstenberg. Oh, there you go. And they also live right there. So this is their hood. And nearby is the IAC, the Interactive Corporation Building, which actually looks like a, an iceberg. Oh, wow. Um, we have a question from Stacy about the dogs on the Titanic. How many okay. dogs were there on the Titanic? Well, as I said, there's either 10 or 11. Uh, experts are not really, they kind of differ on that, but we, you know, have written uh, things to go on after that. But uh, in the Titanic Museum, as I recollected, it could be Branson, but I believe it's Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. They have a nice write-up, you know, each one has a little sign and it shows a picture of what they would have looked like and so on and so on. So that's really nice. Now, I don't know much more than that, what I said, but of the three dogs, uh, I don't know how the breakdown is, but there, there are two species, Pomeranian and Pekingese. Now, one of them was actually killed by another dog in Central Park a couple of weeks later. Oh my gosh. I know, right? <laughs> and one of the dogs was handed down to one of the maids and then was given off to a bridesmaid or something like that. And a few, like, few years later was either stolen or ran away, disappeared. And the third dog, there's no written evidence, so we don't know what happened to the third dog. But one of the dogs was owned by Henry Sleeper Harper, who survived uh, Titanic on Lifeboat 3, and he's actually buried up in the Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Wow. So we have, um, oh my gosh, honestly, we have um, some questions about, oh, we have a question from William wasn't the Jane Hotel originally the Riverview Hotel, he wants to know? It's had several names, and that wouldn't surprise me at all. Again, it's been here over a century. That's the same one. Uh, it was uh, simply placed for sailors, and they changed management, and or probably was uh, tossed aside by management several times. Uh, it actually had a very... Uh, dicey history in the bad old days in New York, this 1970s and 1980s, or, you know, drugs and crime and all sorts of things going on there today. It's a boutique hotel with a nice little brunch area in the front where you can look out at the, at the river, basically this view, by the way, because they, the front area faces this way. They have a little theater where they have the New York premiere of Hedwig and the Angry Inch, and they... Uh, have a beautiful woman's side, but um, the actual beginning couldn't actually say, but I wouldn't be surprised. And the rooms, by the way, if anybody is in town, are not big, but they're very nice inside the Jane. And there's an enormous, beautiful hotel bar, which is out in the open, and it overlooks the Hudson River from high up. So it's very beautiful. Wow, that's nice. And just another note about the dogs, by the way. There's a rumor that John Jacob Astor IV actually opened the kennel of the dogs, but that's apocryphal and probably not true because that story came from an unidentified survivor on Carpathy who told that to Robert Nor R. Norris Williams. So if that story was told on, on Carpathy, it couldn't have come from JJ. And it certainly doesn't come from Madeline because she never spoke to the press at all. So it was, um, whoever it was, it was not JJ Ford. That seems to be a common story for some reason. Thanks. 
So I've got two questions. They're going to be the last questions that I ask you. And they're about um, your research process. Um, Maureen wants to know if um, you have been to the touring exhibit of items from the Titanic. And Stacy wants to know if in your research you've spoken to people who have family members or you know, who are survive, who were survivors, um, and sort of, you know, in general, I'm curious how, how this has all taken shape for you. Excellent questions. Okay, well, first, uh, the first person was talking about the Titanic exhibit. That's a traveling show, and it was originally just one set of artifacts, but now it's in two or three, and they just all keep making the rounds. I mean, all over the world, not just the U.S., but they show up in, you know, Croatia and Australia and, you know, just yeah. Camden, Delaware, and just, you know, everywhere. And there's sort of an issue here about the uh, salvage because the big uh, museums in Pigeon Forge in Tennessee, they do not agree with salvage. So they have many artifacts, but they were uh, donated from families, like somebody's uh, buttons or their Masonic pins or this painful mm -hmm. tooth that Selena Rogers Cook had extracted on Titanic or, uh, you know, journals, <laughs> diaries, I know, right? <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> Uh, but those are from people themselves as the Titanic Historical Society, but the Titanic exhibit is from things like plates and dishes and parts of and, uh, the telegraph, which is how you, you send and receive signals from the debris field and maybe even from the vessel herself. There's different legal statuses to those things. So that's what they have, which gives them an enormous wealth of things. They have tiles, and I can't even begin to tell you how many amazing things they pulled out, but they are from the sand two and a half miles below the sea. But I saw the first one in 2009 here in New York, but again, I was a civilian then, I wasn't an enthusiast, so it's just another cool New York thing to do. But it was back here a couple of years ago in New Jersey, and I went as a Titanic enthusiast at the time, actually went several times, uh, myself with Kathy Lamette the second time, and Fred Plancy the first time. But uh, that's traveling around and uh, apparently it was in Boston for a long time and just everywhere. So, but again, there's two or three traveling now. So if you see a set here, if you talk to your friend and, uh, you know, box parts, you know, somewhere else, they may or may not have seen the same set of items. Uh, now, as for research, uh, I have, uh, you know, we, <laughs> there's a uh, Titanic enthusiast who have absurd pictures that they contribute of their bookcases with just, you know, dozens and dozens of books. And today there's over 3,000 books written about Titanic, most of them crap, but um, there's some very good ones. For example, there's On a Sea of Glass, which is so big it's perfect bound and that's still very small print. But there's also one called Titanic and Illustrated Journey by Don Lynch. And he's the official historian for the Titanic Historical Society. And he himself has actually met 20 survivors of the sinking of Titanic. But there's many other good books. And believe it or not, there are good books coming out even to this day. Just amazing things about new aspects and just things we're finding out from old paperwork. And so it's really interesting to find out these things. So there's that and there's chat groups and just copying and pasting and just listening to smart people like Don Lynch. And just for myself, being a New Yorker, a lot of footwork. And as I mentioned before at the beginning, virtually all the modern photographs are mine. That's so great. And you're working on a book. Can you, yes. can you tell us where we can find your, your work? Well, right now it's all progress and no results. So I have so much field work, I have to just put it into a readable form. And once I can get a, a format to it that people can actually digest, I'll be going ahead with that. That'll be the really good work. But I've really, I don't know if I want to give away my secret here, but I have many, many street addresses and my blades broke, so I'm not using them anymore. But I, what I would do is I would line up about 10 locations in a day and I would blade around New York. I would skate around and I would take modern pictures. And this is where somebody lived. That's where they worked. That's where they prayed and so on and so on. And so I've just gathered a lot of photographs of things like that. And, uh, you know, so I can't show you the old church or the old, you know, mansion, but I can show you where they are now. And that was the basis of a lot of my work, but, uh, you know, a lot of other things that I've just found on my own. 
amazing. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this, even though we have many more questions and could probably talk all night. Um, but I'm so I'm so grateful to you for for your knowledge and your pictures and your time. Um, this was wonderful. Thank you, everyone who has been here with us. It's been great to chat with you. Um, take really good care.